is expect. Fueling this bitterness are reports on Israeli television of Palestinians celebrating the massacre in the streets of Ramallah, and the reports are all true. Among the hovels of the Ein Helwi refugee camp in Lebanon, Palestinians even dance the traditional dabke in their satisfaction at the killings. In 1991, as you know, after the liberation of Kuwait by American, British, and other Allied forces, President George Bush Sr. called upon the Kurds and the Shiites to rise up against Saddam Hussein's army. They did so, and then, of course, we betrayed them, gave them no help. And amazingly, when they poured in their hundreds of thousands towards Kuwait for refuge, American troops were ordered to turn them round. This is the story of one staff sergeant of the US military who refused to obey that order. All the while, the tide of sick and starving and frightened people shuffled past us. Some came in hand-pushed carts, old men and babies with filthy blankets thrown over them, and I thought of the medieval carts that went from house to house when the Great Plague struck Europe, collecting the dead. Some of the people in these carts were dead. There were two television crews pointing their lenses at close range into the faces of the refugees, and I noticed how, for once, the faces did not react to the cameras. It was as if every face was also dead. Two U.S. embassy officials were standing beside a station wagon, along with a senior American officer. We can't have them all just coming down here, one of the embassy men said to Staff Sergeant Nold of the 1st Armored Division. They can't cross the border. We have no facilities to handle this. They've got to go back. Look, you've got to stop them moving down this road, the embassy man was saying. It's tragic, I know that, but we simply don't have the facilities for them. It wasn't supposed to be like this. Liberation, a clean victory, and now this mess, and on television. You can see his problem. You've got to stop them, Sergeant, the embassy man repeated. The officer joined in. Iraqi agents could infiltrate back into Kuwait among the refugees. But suddenly, there on this cold, damp, hellish road, all the bright sunlight of what was best about America, all the hope and compassion and humanity that Americans like to believe they possess, suddenly shone among us. For the young, tired, first armored staff sergeant turned angrily on the man from the U.S. Embassy. I'm sorry, sir, but if you're going to give me an order to stop these people, I can't do that. They're coming here begging, old women crying, sick children, boys begging for food. We've already given them most of our rations, but I have to tell you, sir, that if you give me an order to stop them, I just won't do that. You could see the embassy men wince. You could see the embassy men wince. First it was these pesky folk cluttering up the highway, then the television cameras, and now a soldier who wouldn't obey orders. But Sergeant Knoll just turned his back on the diplomat and walked over to a queue of refugee cars. Tell these people to park at the side of the road over there, he yelled at the soldiers on his checkpoint. Tell them to be patient. We'll look after them. Don't send them back. Now a line of battered cars was driving steadily towards Knoll's position, packed with fearful civilians. Many had not eaten for days. The men were unshaven, the women in tears, the children urinating in the car in the long journey across a devastated Iraq. Whole families were crying for civilian relatives killed in the Allied air assault. Their convoy stank. A little girl was held out of the window of an old black Mercedes by a screaming woman. The child's body was jerking grotesquely, the convulsions about to kill her. Nold ordered one of his men to run down the line of the cars. Where is the car with the sixth child? The soldier kept shouting in English until someone translated his question into Arabic. There was a wail from the Mercedes. Get a medic down here, the soldier ordered. Two more Americans arrived, a big black soldier who took the little girl into his arms and touched her brow. Oh, Jesus, she's having a fit, he said. Tell the field hospital we're coming down with her. There would be no medals for performing these duties. And with good reason, for a conflict of interest was becoming apparent. That is why the American officer and the U.S. diplomats had arrived to inspect Nod's position. The newly returned and legitimate government of Kuwait, on whose behalf we had gone to war, had no desire to see these refugees given sanctuary in Kuwait. The officer even muttered into Noll's ear the following revealing sentence. We had an Iraqi soldier give himself up here, near here the other day, and a Kuwaiti soldier just took him to one side, shot him in the head, pushed his body into a ditch. If you let these people through, Sergeant, they could face the same danger. Noll looked at the officer in contempt. He must have known very well what was going on. He was being ordered to send these people back to their deaths, not because of lack of facilities or Iraqi infiltration, but because the Kuwaitis didn't want them cluttering up their newly liberated treasure house emirate, and Nold refused. There weren't many good moments in this war, or any other, but here, just for a moment, an angel's wings brushed past us. The spirit of Raoul Wallenberry 
in the Budapest rail yards, handing out Swedish passports to the doomed Jews of Hungary. No, this wasn't the Second World War. Let us have done with such obscene parallels. But these Iraqis would die if they were forced to turn back, and the sergeant had disobeyed an order so that they might live. <clears throat> From the very end of my book, The Great War for Civilization, a pessimism I have no excuse for because it's real. In the days that followed the occupation, I could only feel depressed. Death seemed to possess the Middle East and haunt my own life. Page after page of my journalist contacts book would have little notes beside names. Died 2004, I had written, next to Margaret Hassan's Baghdad telephone number. Murdered 14205, I now wrote, beside Rafik Hariri's name. Edward Said, that majestic Palestinian scholar, he who had once sworn to me that he would stay alive because so many people wanted him dead. He had died of leukemia, depriving Palestinians of their most eloquent voice. In March 2003, Rachel Corrie, the young American woman who traveled to Gaza to try to prevent the Israelis from destroying Palestinian homes, stood in front of an Israeli caterpillar bulldozer to force the driver to stop, but he drove over her, and then he drove over her again, and when her friends ran to her help, she said, my back is broken, and she died. Did we react to these constant tragedies of life and death? No, I would say journalism should be a vocation. One could be angry at death, but we were not here to weep. Doctors, and I'm not comparing journalism to the medical profession, don't cry while they're operating on the desperately sick. Our job is to record, to point the finger when we can, to challenge those centers of power about which Amira Haas had so courageously spoken. But I felt exhausted. There were times when I wondered how long I would continue flying across the Atlantic, escaping the kidnappers of Baghdad, increasingly stunned by the growing tragedy of the Middle East. In Baghdad in 2005, I walked to the voting booths with whole Iraqi families, men with babies in their arms, children with their mothers, as the air pulsated to the sound of the day's first suicide bombers. It was a moving experience. Rarely do you see collective courage on this scale. And an Iraqi government was formed of sorts, dominated for the first time by the country's Shia Muslims, but broken by the one phenomenon that undermined its legitimacy, the continued American occupation. In the polling stations, many of the families told us they were voting for power, but also for an end to the occupation. And the occupation was not going to end. The Americans must leave, I used to say to myself. And they will leave, but they can't leave. This was the terrible equation that now turned sand into blood. The Americans insisted that they wanted democracy across the Middle East. Iraq would be the start. But what Arab nation wanted to join the hell disaster that Iraq had now become? Yes, Arabs and other Muslims wanted some of that bright, shiny democracy, which we like to brandish in front of them. But they wanted something else. They wanted justice, a setting to rights, a peaceful but an honorable fair end to the decades of occupation and deceit and corruption and dictator creation. The Iraqis wanted an end to our presence as well as to Saddam's regime. They wanted to control their own land and their own oil. The Syrians wanted Golan back. The Palestinians wanted a state, even if it was built on less than 22% of mandate Palestine, not a 20-foot wall and occupation. The Iranians had freed themselves from the Shah, America's brutal policeman in the Gulf, only to find themselves living in a graveyard of theocracy, their democratic elections betrayed by men who feed off the hatred for America that now lies like a blanket over the Middle East. The Afghans resisted the Soviet Union and wanted help to restore their country. They were betrayed and finished in the hands of the Taliban, and then another great army came into their land. However much the newly installed rulers and the old surviving dictators whom we've helped to power over past decades might praise the West or thank us for our financial loans or for our political support or for invading their countries, there were millions of Muslims who wanted something more. They wanted freedom from us. Thank you, Mr.
welcome. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm Laura Flanders from Radio Nation. This is Robert Fritz. Robert, congratulations on your lifetime achievement. I hope your achievements aren't over, or your lifetime. No, I was worried about the lifetime bit, actually, when I saw the award. <laughs> <laughs> It's I, not over yet, I promise you. A lot of us are here because we appreciate your work, but I think a lot of us are also here because we feel so urgently about what you write about. And before we get into the meat of the matter of your book and your work, thinking of the people that you know and, and care about so obviously in Beirut, in Baghdad, in Gaza City, in Tel Aviv, in Kabul, how would you describe the moment that we're in tonight? All those cliches, precipice, quagmire, they're all... Yeah, they are cliches, aren't they? Um, well, I've been in the Middle East now for 31 years, and it has never been such a dangerous, tragic place. Um, you know, I was recalling the other day that um, when I first went there in 1976, the Lebanese Civil War was on, the Islamic Revolution took place, of course, in 79, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And normally, two or three times a week, the Middle East was the top story on the BBC News. And once, twice a day, I would file a story to London. Now, I wake up in the morning in my apartment in Beirut, which is opposite the sea with the palm trees outside, and I hear the water sloshing on the rocks. And I think, where is the explosion today? You know that scene in um, The Day After Tomorrow, where the great flood wave sweeps into New York, and the people happily burn the tax books in the public library? Um, it's a bit like that wave coming. Where do you, what do you write today? You're overwhelmed by the story as a journalist. The top six items on the BBC when I left Beirut two days ago were about the Middle East. And, and when I first came, you know, the enemies of the West, and you include Israel in the West, were always nationalists, Ba'athists, socialists, friends of the Soviet Union. Now, in Gaza, West Bank, Lebanon, Iraq, Afghanistan, they're all Islamists. It's much more a religious war now than it was before. And I don't see any sign that we have grasped save perhaps this rather tiny little conference which is going to involve the Iranians and the Syrians and the Americans in Baghdad, if it takes place. Any sign that there is any grasp of the major powers in the West of, of the depth of humiliation, of the hell disaster which the people of the regions are going through. I'm talking particularly of the Iraqis. I don't think that figure of 600,000 dead is at all an exaggeration. I mean, maybe it's 500,000, but you know, it becomes obscene to argue about figures like that. Um, and we don't seem to realize. I mean, I, I went through the whole of the South Lebanon war on the ground in Lebanon. It began on July the 12th, my 60th birthday. It was quite a birthday present to have. And at the end of it, in which the Israelis believed they lost, they certainly almost lost a warship. They had Hezbollah missiles crashing onto the top of their top secret air traffic control center at Miron. They lost 40 soldiers in the last 36 hours of the war. And the Hezbollah did not leave and kept their weapons, and Bush announced it was a victory for Israel, and the Hezbollah were beaten. You know, I feel it more and more in Iraq, where everything is supposed to be still getting better, despite the fact it's not. We have surges and spikes and all these other cliches which get caught up in the New York Times. You know, you hear this, and, and you realize that our leaders, and I'm also thinking of our own dear leader, Mr. Blair, or Lord Blair of Kutalamara, as I call him in the paper. <laughs> Kutalamara being the greatest defeat of British arms in 1915 in Iraq. And I realize that they're lying, and they must know that they're lying, but the astonishing thing is that they act on the basis of their lies. Mm. And I've never experienced mm. this in the Middle East before. It's very political where a story starts, as you know. Yeah. Uh -huh. How did you decide to start your book? Why did you decide to start your book, The Great War for Civilization, with your father's war? Well, it doesn't actually start with him. He, he comes into it. The book is not chronological. Um, well, my father, in his old age, was a very right-wing, cantankerous, conservative man. He uh, loved policemen, magistrates' courts. He supported capital punishment long after we'd banned hanging in Britain. Um, he was a very sad man in many ways because he was always very angry. When he went into 